What's up, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Laura You Know podcast. And I'm pumped to have with me today as a guest, Joel Waldman from Surviving the Survivor. And he's known for usually having the best guests in true crime on his show, but now I have him on my show. So I, I'm interested. Now I, it sounds like I have the best guests in true crime because you're here on my podcast. Joel, welcome. Thank you, man. It's uh, great to be here. It is a bit of a conundrum now that I am on your show. What do we do now? Of course, uh, you know, you've had a lot of great guests on as well, but we do, uh, you know, we do this panel type show. Uh, I was saying on a, on a other show recently, everything I've kind of done, I've just done accidentally. But what we realized we're doing is this show live. Uh, and I know you're constantly live, but we're, we're live every night with a panel. So somehow I became like the, uh, the Larry King of true crime, but I love it. You know, I'm kind of the, the, uh, dumb, dumb in the corner. And I ask questions of the smart guys like you and, uh, find out the answers to some complicated cases in my next life. I will go to law school. Yeah. You, you're going through the school of the hard knocks now learning it, learning it this way, but you know, it's, it's always interesting. And I've tried to do a little bit of that with this podcast, you know, ask the questions I think the chat has. And when I say the chat, I just mean a normal person. Right. And that's kind of what I think you're bringing to the table is, you're looking at the case like a normal person, like a citizen, like somebody could sit on a jury and you're asking questions to all sorts of different kinds of people on these different cases. And you're bringing a perspective that I think is really important. And it's not most, you know, newscasters or journalists or media people don't have that opportunity to just honestly ask questions in a live format, react to what the chat's saying, react to what the people on the panel are saying and kind of feel the vibe and go where it's going. But I, I think it's awesome because you have people relevant to the cases on too. And the case we're going to talk about today is Dan Markell's case um, and the Adelson family. Dan Markell is a professor of mine at Florida State University College of Law, known as a criminal defense savant. Um, he was a brilliant guy. He was probably not going to be at Florida State for long, although I would have loved to see him there, but he was probably going on to bigger and better things if I had to guess. And I remember hearing the news that he was brutally killed in his driveway in suburbia. Um, so give us a little summary of what's going on in this case. What got you into it? And, you know, where are we in this long process that is prosecuting the Adelson family? Yeah, um, great question with a probably a longer answer than you want. But, you know, I was, uh, as you mentioned, I was uh, in TV news for uh, many, many years. And uh left because I was traveling too much. So I had this brilliant idea of, uh, of asking my mother, uh, to join the show. Who's now 85 years old, a child Holocaust survivor, because she's smart and she is highly opinionated. And I thought she would make for great TV, but we thought that we could be, you know, like the next, uh, everyone does the, the next Joe Rogan. And, uh, we were failing miserably and, uh, connected with an old friend of mine, um, named Steve Cohen, who is now our, you know, booking producer, a big part of the show. And uh, he was going through some stuff in his own life at the time, um, relationship wise. And he was really fixated on the Dan Markell case. I'd never heard of it. This is going back probably close to three years now. Um, and so I just started kind of reading up on it, found it incredibly intriguing. Uh, Carm and I were uh, in a different studio back then and uh, started doing a couple of shows and, you know, we saw our numbers go up and um, the rest is kind of history, as they say. It happened to coincide not long after with uh, the quadruple stabbings uh, at the University of Idaho. And then when that happened, I always say this in news, it's always unfortunate uh, tragedies that can kind of propel people forward. But after uh, the University of Idaho coupled with Dan Markell, we just saw, you know, um, a lot more numbers and, and a possibility here uh, that, there, that there was a there there. And that's when we kind of pivoted to a nightly true crime show. But the Dan Markell case far and away has been uh, the closest one to our hearts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of different connections to Dan Markell. And um, it's a Florida case. And he is a law professor who was married to um, another law professor. And when he passed, people started to kind of think it may have been that because of a, a nasty divorce. Why don't you give us kind of a, an overview of the case? And, you know, we can talk about all the legal procedures that have already happened until now. Um, but Donna Adelson's trial is coming up as yet another defendant in 
uh, Dan Markell's death. So tell us kind of how we got here. What's kind of the overview of the the case in itself? This is the uh, journalist in me. Before we do that, can I ask you, I mean, what what was he like for you as a professor? You know, did you have him for one class? How long? Uh, what was the relationship like? So I, I had him for a seminar, which is like, you know, he basically gives speeches and things like that. It wasn't a normal law school class. And then I had talked to him at office hours a couple of times, but interacting with him. So it's funny. There's a bunch of different Florida State's kind of a, an interesting and cool place. I joke that it's the Harvard of the South, but um, uh, Professor Earhart, right? Chuck Earhart wrote the book on evidence that every lawyer quotes in Florida mm-hmm. in trial on the evidentiary issues that you have when you're making motions and limiting. So that was he was kind of my favorite professor there. I was, I was kind of starstruck by him the most. When I was on mock trial, I would go to him and ask these questions and he would go through the packet with me. Oh, make these objections or this or that or whatever it may be. Markel to me was much more of a brain motivated. Um, if I say nerdy, I mean it in a positive way. Like he, he was really brilliant. I'm not the most brilliant guy in the world. I'm a trial guy. I'm more of a, you know, presenter different kind of a personality. I'm not a, I don't love reading. I'm not like a bookworm. I'm not um, going to be the smartest guy in any class. That was Dan Markell. And you can kind of, kind of feel that when you talk to him. So I really respected him. I learned a ton from him, but he wasn't really somebody I would go to all the time with questions or issues that I had. And we all, I would say like my group of friends that all had him or took class with him or interacted with him. We all kind of knew he was moving up. He was going Ivy league. He was, I mean, the, the guy, the, the, the ceiling was limitless for Dan Markell. And we all knew that in law school at the time. Yeah. Uh, and sadly his life was, uh, cut really short. So to get back to your, uh, original question here, um, you know, who's married to a woman named Wendy Adelson. And again, this is what attracted us to the story so much because you know, I'm a Jewish kid from Jersey and moved down here, mm. got a little bit of an overbearing mother. Then I find out about this woman, Donna Adelson, who's a little overbearing, and so, um, you know, I just start to look into it. But so so Dan is married to Wendy Adelson uh, marriage, like sadly, many do uh, started to go south. I believe they were married back in 2006. And now we sh- scoot ahead to 2013. And, you know, there's just massive problems, separation and impending divorce. And now the mother in law, Donna, is getting in Wendy's business you know, with crazy uh, suggestions like dress your kids in Nazi uniforms uh, just to really annoy Dan, who is becoming more aware of his religion, becoming more Jewish, anything despite Dan. It just got super ugly. Um, Even at the wedding, going back to the wedding, you know, Dan was, again, becoming more uh, conscientious about his Judaism. He wanted kosher food and there was purposely no kosher food catered there. Something happened with the Adelsons. It was a whole thing. Anyway, it was destined, I guess the marriage was for uh, failure. And then, um, you know, they were separated and working on this divorce. 20, uh, fast forward to 2014, um, Dan Markell goes to the gym, goes to drop off kids at uh, daycare, pulls into his driveway and is uh, randomly shot twice in the head. This is July 18th, 2014. Um, incredibly, uh, he lives for about, an, I think, another eight or nine hours. So he succumbs to his injuries the next day. And then it was like off to the races with the uh, police investigation. Yeah. And the the filings in their divorce case, in their family law case, were something to behold in, right? With how nasty it was. There are lots of nasty divorces, right? But when you have two, and Wendy Adelson is also very, very smart. When you have two very smart, very accomplished lawyers fighting in a family law case, they were seemingly trying to use everything against each other. Um, Major custody battle. Both come from really, I almost said really great families. I guess I should say very involved families that cared, that wanted the grandsons in their lives that seem to very much love the grandsons, even if some of their actions are obviously misguided when we talk about the Adelson family and how it kind of all turned out, but a very nasty divorce. So that's kind of why the Adelson family was always in the mix here, but it was a random act of violence or so it seemed. So how are we going to connect that back to Wendy Adelson, who has an alibi, couldn't have been her, no seeming connection to the shooters. They get the shooters. And then where do we go from there? Yeah. So, you know, all this plays out and then it was uh, gumshoe police work, as they say. So 
um, Tallahassee PD are excellent. Um, they, they had one eyewitness, uh, I guess, by the grace of God, uh, this senior citizen who lived next door to Dan Markell thought he heard something, went out, finds Dan. He got like a glimpse of a car, a uh, silver colored Prius type car. And so from there, again, police just started actively working the investigation, um, trying to uh, look at all the uh, bus surveillance video to see if they could get angles on a car from inside the Tallahassee buses. Then they start looking at all the easy passes or, or sun passes, which is what they're called here, easy passes up north, which we all know are what you use to go through the tolls without having to stop, which was a great invention. So eventually they're able to uh, track this car down and uh, even track down the uh, rental place. And uh, turns out it's these two uh, Hispanic Latino guys Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera, who literally grew up 20 blocks from where I'm sitting right now uh, in Miami Beach. Um, you know, you just drive along the beach um, from, you know, in the 40s up to the 90s. And there's a little like pocket between there in the 70s on the beach here on Collins Ave, where, um, you know, there's sort of um this community of, of Latin King gang members, which I never knew about. And that's where Luis Rivera uh, grew up. He was a Latin Kings gang member and he's friends with this guy, Sigfredo Garcia. And then you come to find out Sigfredo Garcia has got children with a woman named Katie Magbanawa. And she was kind of the missing piece to the puzzle. Right. And we find out later that Katie Magbanawa is also a girlfriend or ex-girlfriend of Charlie Adelson, who is a new character for us to, introduce here and successful dentist brother of Wendy Adelson and Wendy Adelson's dad is also a dentist. Mom works at the dental office, successful family from South Florida. <coughs> and so Katie McGonagall, like you said, was the link to all of this was the link uh, from the Adelson family to the shooters. And it's kind of wild how it all happened, right? So they get the shooters and then they start coming after Katie Mabanawa. Law enforcement and the state attorney's office has kind of methodically gone through this case. They didn't try them all at the same time as some big conspiracy. So people were kind of like, what's going to happen? Who was involved? Who knows what? Who's culpable? It started with the shooter and the driver. And then it got to Katie Mabanawa, which was its own wild legal story. Gut health is something I never thought about five years ago. But now that I do, what a difference it makes. It can be really hard to balance everything you need, but AG1 makes it easy with all of their supplements. One scoop of the powder and some cold water every morning takes two seconds to shake up and drink is the best way for me to start my day. They also sent me some of their omega-3 tablets, and that is a new supplement that I will absolutely be adding every single day because it's so much easier than taking the spoonful of the fish oil that I used to do, and it really helps make everything easier to be healthy. So this holiday season, try AG1 for yourself or even gift it to someone special. It's the perfect time to focus on supporting your body with an easy and surprisingly delicious daily health drink. And that's why I'm excited to be partnering with them again. AG1 is offering new subscribers a free $76 gift when you sign up. You'll get a welcome kit, a bowl of D3, K2, and five free travel packs in your first box. So make sure to check out drinkag1.com slash LYK to get this offer. That's drinkag1.com slash LYK to start your new year on a healthier note. Yeah, so it turns out, I mean, excellently laid out there. So Katie, um, as you said, she uh, was dating at one point Charlie Adelson, but she's also the mother to this guy, Sigfredo Garcia's uh, two children. So they immediately connect it. Um, she is the middle woman. Uh, and then the um, FBI gets involved and they start wiretapping uh, Donna Adelson and Charlie Adelson's calls and they're speaking in code. And it becomes really evident that they are hiding something. And all the suspicion by this time has uh, turned to the Adelson family. As you said, Charlie was a uh, you know, really super successful uh, periodontist. They actually did like a... Uh, um, and uh, like a forensic accounting is what I was mm -hmm. trying to look for there. Forensic accounting of Charlie Adelson's uh, finances. And he was making like three to three and a half million dollars a year for like a three year period. So it wasn't just the uh, periodontal work. He did have a successful business where he was traveling around. But, uh, you know, he 
they had dabbled in real estate and I guess it was more than just dabbling. And then there was stories that Charlie was actually, um, you know, selling steroids. He was a pretty Jack guy himself. Everyone knew him as the maestro. He drove around a Ferrari. He was a ladies man. So all these things started to add up and, uh, we got, a, a to look at a side of the Adels Adelson family that no one had really seen or known of beforehand. Yeah. And I didn't even know some of that. And it's, it's where we're going to get once we get finishing with this big summary. So, uh, Catherine McBanawa is offered immunity to testify against everybody. And she did not, she says, no, she rejects it. Yeah. I mean, Peter, I got to stop you there. It's that is to me crazy. I mean, how is she not suing or claiming ineffective assistance of counsel? I mean, they put her basically behind bars. I mean, ultimately the decision would rest with her, right? And they said oh, that yeah. she was afraid to implicate her baby daddy, Sigfredo Garcia. She just didn't want to implicate him, but she is literally, but then she came forward in other trials and told the truth. And now she's sitting in prison the rest of her life. Do you think that, and I don't know this, this is why I ask questions. Do you think that she has a chance of getting out if she cooperates at this point? I, I mean, that's, it would only be because the prosecutors have mercy. That's really the only reason because they don't have to, they've already got her cooked and we're going to get there. Right. Cause people don't, we've, we've almost, almost jumped a step ahead, but <laughs> they've already got her testimony under oath that they can use to point the finger at other people. They pretty much have what they need at this point. So why would they give her anything? I don't know. Maybe they will. Maybe there was a deal done before Charlie Adelson's trial, but she was offered immunity. She rejected it. They go to trial on her case she has a story, which you can tell if you want to, but there's so many different stories in this case. But she says she was innocent, hung jury, round one. So they have to come back. They try her again. They don't give up. Sometimes the state attorneys don't bring a case a second time after a hung jury. Oh, they brought this one because they were not done. They're taking their time and going through methodically, like I said, through this case. They go, they try Catherine Vanawa again, conviction. But they're not done there. Now that they've convicted her, they take the next step and they charge Charlie Adelson. Charlie Adelson, they say, was kind of like you said, the maestro, the ringleader with the money who used Katie Mabanawa, his ex-girlfriend slash person that kind of works for him. They have some kind of, you know, special relationship on their own to enlist her, the father of her children and his friend, you know, whether he's in a gang, whatever reason it may be, but he enlists Katie Mabanawa to enlist her father of her children and money exchanges hands from Charlie Adelson to Catherine Mabanawa to the shooters in the case, and they end up going to trial. Katie Mabanawa testifies against Charlie Adelson. So like you said, she had her opportunity to point the finger and go home to her kids, but instead she chose not to and still pointed the finger and still now ends up in prison for the rest of her life, potentially. Charlie Adelson creates a narrative and a story that he was blackmailed by Katie Mabanawa's uh, father of her children and his friend. They knew Charlie Adelson was rich because of Katie. Katie was involved in it. <coughs> They all blackmail him. So yes, he pays money. There's so many code texts and code words and code languages going on in this case. But at the end of the day, he takes the stand. I thought he did about as good of a job as you could for a defendant taking the stand. I want to get your take on it. Jury convicts him. And then after that conviction, to get us up to speed as to kind of where we're at now, Don Adelson and Harvey Adelson, Wendy Adelson's parents, Charlie Adelson's parents, were getting on a plane, one-way ticket, out of town. But guess what? She's grabbed and arrested at the airport. Now she's been charged in the conspiracy to commit this crime as well. And we're waiting for her trial coming up soon. Yeah. Um, so I was up there for Charlie Adelson's trial. I believe it lasted eight days. The jury with dinner came back in under three hours uh, and convicted him. Uh, and as you well know, Peter, uh, life in Florida, they say, is life. So uh, mm -hmm. there is no expectation of parole and likely will be spending the rest of his time there. Uh, the problem is <clears throat> his defense, as you say, was basically that the Latin Kings, um, and by the way, Sigfredo is not a Latin King, but Luis Rivera, who actually copped a deal with the state and is getting out, you know, within 15 years and probably a lot sooner than that. Um, you know, he was the actual Latin King, uh, gang member. So, um, you know, people get that, uh, confused sometimes, but it was just this absurd story that, the one person that the Adelsons would want gone, uh, somehow Katie's baby daddy and Luis Rivera go up to Tallahassee and eliminate that guy and then extort them. It just, it just made 
no sense. Like there was a leverage there. It, it just didn't add up too much. Uh, but to your point, when Charlie testified, I think there was a concern in the courtroom because he was incredibly smooth. I mean, he's a smart guy. Uh, but the I guess the one rub or the big rub I had uh, was he was too smooth. Like he was so well rehearsed. He knew the answer to absolutely everything. Uh, he re he recalled dates, specific dates. But then when he was asked, you know, obvious questions uh, about something else, his memory failed him. So uh, I think the jurors just saw right through that. Um, and again, it, it was super fascinating uh, to be there. There was one alternate juror that looked just had the we had the sense that this person was leaning in favor of uh, Charlie Adelson. And in other words, of, you know, acquitting him, uh, that person ended up being an alternate and he was convicted uh, quite quickly after that. Yeah, I mean, there's so many fascinating spots we're going to go with this discussion. It took us 20 minutes just to try to define <laughs> the web that was weaved here in this case. But um, when we think about Charlie Adelson's trial specifically, I think that they went for something to try and explain away all the evidence. They didn't necessarily go for reasonable doubt in that evidence was missing or didn't make sense, but instead... They tried to use the code words. They tried to use the money exchanging hands. They tried to use the connections between Katie McBanawa and the shooter and Katie McBanawa and Charlie Adelson, the forensic accounting that he was paying Katie McBanawa, but she was actually working. But then Katie McBanawa said no. So then it had to be actually it was part of the bribe. And, you know, all that stuff to me, they tried to explain away. And it's really difficult to try to explain away every single fact. And just like you said, he had an explanation for everything, which, you know, from a lawyer's perspective, I'm like, wow, he did a really good job. Mm -hmm. But he's also a very smart guy who has not, not a care in the world except for this trial. So he's reviewing all the discovery, all the text messages, all the phone calls. He's memorizing dates. Like his life depends on this literally. So that's why he knows everything. But, you know, to your average juror, I, I think they saw through it and they said, no, you know, we, we believe the case, the state's narrative. We believe the witnesses for the state. And of course, the defense said Katie Mabana was a proven liar and admitted liar. She told a completely different story in her trial to try to save her own neck. Now she's telling a different story to try to get Charlie Adelson to try to lessen her sentence because she's working with the state. You know, they pointed all that out and tried to impeach her credibility as much as possible. But at the end of the day, the jury just didn't buy it. And we get to the step of Donna Adelson. There was a bump, right? Where mm -hmm. they go to Donna Adelson, they give her something that basically says, um, you know, we know you're in on it. Give us some more money or whatever it may be. And you, you can explain the bump a little bit more, but Don Adelson specifically was mentioned so much throughout Charlie Adelson's trial, whether it was emails that she was sending feelings she had towards Dan Markell, which, you know, again, going back to your other point where really that's what they decided to do is go take the life of Dan Markell to extort Charlie Adelson. Like why not do it to Charlie Adelson or to one of Charlie right. Adelson's family members that he actually loves, not a guy he hates or that his family very clearly hates, which was proven in the emails versus the state's narrative that they needed to get Dan out of the picture. So Wendy and the parents could do whatever they want with their grandkids. And that's the motive. And that's the story that just made more sense at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, that's the part of the story. Exactly. Uh, you laid it out really well again, but that, that just doesn't make sense. Why? Would they eliminate the one guy that all the Adelsons wanted eliminated um, and drive, by the way, uh, which they did twice, like seven and a half, eight hours, you know, that drive up to Tallahassee. Um, they were obviously uh, getting paid and, uh, you know, come to find out that that's the truth after the fact. But you're asking about uh, the bump and shout out to the bump man, who is uh, a very cool guy. Uh, we're going to get him on the show once these trials are over, but uh, he can't speak yet. But, you know, he does undercover work um, for the FBI. He's retired now um, and he's got stories for days. I've had dinner with him and uh, really an incredible guy. And I didn't realize the full extent. There's like an undercover school uh, at the FBI and it's super selective. So these guys are like the best of the best at doing what they do. And he often would play, you know, like a thug gang member. Uh, he speaks fluent Spanish. Uh, he was, you know, based here in Miami uh, at that time. And so, um, you know, they basically gave him the job of pretending to be a friend or family of the the uh, gang member slash uh, shooter, uh, in this case, Fredo and Luis. And he goes up uh, on this very expensive piece of real estate on Fifth Street in Miami Beach, the condos are all, you know, multi-million dollar condos where the Adelsons were now living. 
And uh, it's literally, you know, I went there and did a whole like tour on YouTube of it, but she comes down the stairs of her building and literally across the street is where the grandsons are going to school, Benjamin and Lincoln. And they're uh, obviously real victims in all this too. And he stops her, the bump man, Mr. Bump man stops her and essentially gives her a piece of paper and says, we need more money. You got to take care of my family. And they just fell for it hook, line and sinker, you know, within a matter of minutes, Donna's on the phone and she and Charlie are now speaking in code. And then eventually, uh, Charlie asked her a series of questions and, you know, who's it about? And she says something to the effect of just the two of us. So, um, super suspicious, highly suspicious and a really well-played bump. What was interesting about it is I, I spoke to the bump guy and he said, um, you know, I wanted to go in there like a tough guy and scare the crap out of her, but uh, I was told to be nice. And if you watch it, he was really, you know, kind of kind and, and soft spoken, which is sort of hilarious because he's this big, scary guy. And uh, nevertheless, Donna was scared and fell for it. And uh, that really helped the state build their case. Yeah. And, and at the end, I want to get into, do we think Wendy Adelson's next or Harvey? Because people are asking how far this conspiracy mm -hmm. goes. But um there are some really interesting aspects to the case and what's going on with Don Adelson's. And, you know, one of the reasons I, I also love your perspective and want to talk about and what you, you know, joke about, you know, you being the best guest here, your best guest in true crime, but you do have so many different people connected to the case, involved in the case. You go there, you talk to people, um, you have, you know, lawyers from Tallahassee on. So as we went through a guy named Daniel Rashbaum, who I believe has also been on your show yeah. is we hear his name so much. And come to find out, he represented the Adelson family kind of at first when they thought they might be implicated in this crime. Then Charlie was the first Adelson charge. So Dan Rashbaum represents Charlie. After his trial, when Don Adelson gets charged, Dan Rashbaum represents Don Adelson. And we have a hearing where Don Adelson waives any conflict. One of the problems is, and, and Charlie Adelson, who's been convicted, has hired, in my opinion, the best appellate lawyer in Tallahassee, uh, Michael Ufferman, one of my moot court uh, coaches and judges when I was at Florida State College of Law. And I had him on my show as well. I don't know if he's been on yours. Super smart, thoughtful guy. I, yeah. I, if he's going to say they, something in a document, I trust it. I'll just say that. Yeah. By the way, um, they say he's the best in the entire state. That's what they say. Absolutely. Uh, that's that's who would be the first guy I would call to do a criminal appeal. That that yeah. would absolutely be what it, who it was. Um, so, and he literally wrote the book on some aspects of it as well. So he says in his appeal, in Charlie Adelson's appeal, that Charlie Adelson never, I think he used some language like on the record, waived the conflict of interest between Daniel Rashbaum and Donna Adelson, who he represented before representing Charlie Adelson. And when Donna Adelson shows up for trial, which you were there, so I want to get your perspective of what was happening in the courtroom, everything explodes and implodes as Daniel Rashbaum is basically forced off the case because Charlie Adelson objected to him representing Donna Adelson, where Charlie Adelson might be a, a witness at trial. And then the other lawyer, his name is escaping me, is like, I think I can stay on the case, Judge. We built a wall. And Alex a Morris. Wall. I don't know what's going on. Sorry. Yeah, Alex Morris. Alex Morris. But then come to find out later... Not a good enough ethical wall was built, and he is also removed from the case. So now Don Adelson has brand new lawyers. Her trial that was supposed to happen back then has no trial date at this point because they kicked it to December, I think, and then now we're waiting for a new trial date. Tell us what it was like in that courtroom trying to figure out what's going on. I think Tim Jansen, he was either there or you talked to him. I know him as Jameis Winston's lawyer. Uh, yeah. That's the first time I ever heard his name, and that's what always pops into my head when I hear his name. I've never met him before, but he was there talking to you about the process. What was the vibe in the room? What were people talking about? I always assumed there was a written waiver that we just had never seen. When you represent co-defendants or family members, usually you get a written waiver, whether it's a car accident or a criminal case. And without that, you just can't do it for the most part. Yeah. I mean, it took everyone, you know, by complete shock. So, you know, I was up there, um, it was going to be the first day of jury selection. And uh, suddenly there are these hearings you hear from Offerman that Offerman, and you're going to understand this a lot better than me. So, Correct me if I'm wrong, but Michael Offerman, who is now Charlie's appellate attorney, and keep in mind uh, what Peter just said, this guy, Dan Rashbaum, who was Charlie's defense attorney, 
started off as Charlie, I mean, as as uh, Donna and Harvey, the parents' um, attorney. So he starts off as Donna and Harvey's attorney. Somewhere along the line becomes Charlie's defense attorney. And then somewhere along the line after Charlie's conviction becomes Donna's defense attorney again. So um, it's almost impossible. Uh, people were you know, saying this all along. How are we not going to have this major conflict here? And basically, um, Michael Ufferman, who is the appellate attorney for Charlie Adelson, said, uh, we don't want Dan Rashbaum to be able to cross-examine Charlie because of, uh, or Donna because of, because of these conflicts. So it became this huge to-do. The judge had to step in. Alex Morris um, had come on. He's a Tallahassee-based attorney, a real level-headed, seemingly good guy. Uh, kind of gets dragged into this. And um, and he says, well, look, we built this wall, um, you know, this ethical wall. So I don't know certain things. And then, you know, they had a question Donna under oath. They had a question Alex they had a question Dan in camera. And ultimately, like you said, without getting too complicated about it all, Dan Rashbaum withdrew before he would have definitely been kicked off. And then ultimately, Alex Morris steps in with another guy named Adam Commissar. They were going to take the case and judge Everett said, uh, uh, I'm, I'm worried about conflicts. So we were joking, you know, Sarah Boone had was on her ninth attorney. Now I think Don is on her fourth and fifth attorney. So uh, she's sort of catching up to Sarah Boone in that way. Yeah. Little different circumstances, but sure. <laughs> and, yeah. and even the interesting part about all of this is like, there are unwaivable conflicts and that has been known to be one in the past that, your old lawyer can't cross-examine you to help a different person and make you look bad basically as a witness, which may have happened with Charlie Adelson. And I will say, <clears throat> like, you can do this. Like, there have been cases where a lawyer has represented multiple family members. Usually there are conflict waivers, joint defense agreements that, you know, we're all in this together. We're not going to point the finger at each other. Agreements like that. Seems like none of that was the case here. And one of the major arguments... <clears throat> in uh, Charlie Adelson's appeal um, is, and kind of the overarching theme of why this is such a big issue is, during Charlie Adelson's case, Don, neither Donna nor Harvey were called as witnesses. And why? Why was that? And the question has to be asked, was Daniel Rashbaum protecting his former clients? Donna Adelson and Harvey Adelson. I'm not accusing them of that. It's a, it's a legal question. It's a legal yeah. hypothetical. Because if you're willing to do that to the harm or the detriment of your current client, Charlie Adelson, that is not effective assistance of counsel. That is not a waivable conflict. That is a potential serious appellate issue. And so if his defenses or going hard at certain witness, witnesses to prove his innocence or point the finger at them, maybe Donna was the one that knew what was going on and Charlie was the innocent bystander who was just the money bag who was paying even though his mom knew what was going on. Was that a plausible defense? Maybe not. But was it something Daniel Rashbaum refused to investigate because of his relationship with Donna Adelson? And if that's the case, was it fully explained and agreed to by Charlie Adelson? That's a huge question now hanging over Charlie Adelson's conviction. Yeah, I mean, it's it's massive. Uh, obviously, uh, the appellate issue, um, you know, they basically kicked it down back to the circuit judge, uh, circuit court to see, you know, if Charlie could get um, a, re a retrial. And, uh, you know, the the odds of that happening, from what I understand from lawyers, is, is quite slim. But uh, it was a real, you know, slippery slope. I did have Dan Rashbaum on the show. and. Um, you know, I asked him that specific question, I think by fluke more than anything else, but I really laid it out in terms of the waivers. And he said, Charlie, Harvey and Donna had all signed these waivers. I mean, he says it, uh, you know, in black and white uh, during this interview I did. I think it was the only interview he did because afterwards, I don't think he he looked too good uh, after the fact. And this was leading up to, I believe, Charlie's trial it was leading up to Charlie's trial. So. Um, he got himself in a bit of a mess. Um, there were there were content creators that were outraged about it so much that they so much so that they, you know, that they approached the Florida bar and filed complaints. Oh, wow. So now there's actually an ethics complaint opened uh, against Dan Rashbaum. And again, you would know this much better than I, but it seems like he is in a bit of uh, hot water. I don't know, legally uh, so, but definitely ethically, I, I think. And uh, he has laid very low since then and uh 
It's kind of been the fall guy for this entire mess. Yeah, I, I don't think Dan Rashbaum's a bad guy. I would be willing. I don't know if I. I don't know him at all, so it's hard for me to really put a lot of weight into this. But I would be very surprised if he didn't think Charlie Adelson waived the conflict. Now it was a mistake to not get it in writing and on the record. Um, that's absolutely a mistake and something he should have done. But I, I hope that at least they had the conversation and Charlie did waive the conflict at some point. Now was it waivable? Was it not? Legal question. This is why I always talk about, you know, lawyers, we should stay as far away from the line as possible, not try to get up as close to the line without crossing it as we can, just like anything in life. Um, but but definitely some issues coming for Dan Rashbaum, and he's off the case. And one of the interesting factors about this is, say whatever you want about the conflicts and should he have done it, should he have not, he knew the case. He knew the facts backwards and forwards. And I think Alex Morris thought Dan Rashbaum was going to do most of the heavy lifting during the trial. So when it was kicked to him, he was like, oh, crap, we still need a continuance till December. And now the judge is like, no, you're out. So it does set Donna Adelson back quite a bit to have to have a completely new defense team. I believe she hired a former judge and a criminal yeah. defense attorney team now to represent her. What are you hearing about them? Yeah, so the, she hired, by the way, the whole thing with Donna Adelson is that she hated Tallahassee and wanted her grandkids closer to her in Miami. And the irony is she's now in Tallahassee, locked up in the Leon County Jail, uh, as was her uh son charlie and charlie now by the way is said to be back in south dakota i believe he was sent there because uh they said that he was green lighted for a hit meaning that they were going to try to kill him in prison uh for having you know uh basically laid the lay uh having laid the blame on the latin king gangs during his trial but uh donna now does have attorneys four and five a guy named josh zellman who's actually from the miami area and uh lives and works in tallahassee and then a judge named uh, Jackie Fulford. Um, sorry about that. And I just had a little glitch on the computer. Um, sorry about that. Um, You're good. You're good. So, yeah. So he hires this woman also. Her name is Judge Jackie Fulford. But what's interesting about that is she hand handled the probate part of uh, Dan Markell's divorce. So immediately we're thrown into another bizarre conflict and uh on top of that she had some allegations against her she was basically forced to retire uh from the bench citing some sort of disability but there was really an inquiry into some unethical behavior from her and uh she left so that in investigation never actually took place but she's definitely got an asterisk on her uh on her resume and now of all things uh, her other business is owning a funeral parlor so these are uh, Wendy, or I should say Donna's two new attorneys, number four and number five. And of course, the question always remains, which is why it was a slip of tongue. What's going to happen to Wendy, which we can get to eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Don Adelson's trial, I expect. And again, and one of the cool things is you bring your perspective, but also so many others perspective of the people you spoke to, but does everybody, I expect Donna Adelson's trial to look a lot like Charlie Adelson's trial, just one more step removed. And if we remember the theme of the case for the state for Charlie Adelson's trial, it was like, I can't remember what the verbiage was, but it was like, it started with Sigfredo, then went, or went, started with Luis, then Sigfredo, then Katie McBanawa, then Charlie Adelson, then Donna Adelson. And then it went from Donna Adelson to Charlie Adelson to Katie McBanawa. So it was like playing telephone, connecting all the links in this chain. And I expect something similar, except they're going to be focusing on Donna Adelson at the end of that chain. And they're going to have a lot of emails for motive that, probably more than we heard for Charlie Adelson's case because Charlie didn't write a lot of those. Donna did, but a lot of emails with the motive that Donna Adelson hated Dan Markell, wanted to get him out. The most important thing in her life was having control over Wendy and Wendy's boys to have them back down in South Florida with them. And the biggest impediment to that or block to that was Dan Markell. And she was going to do anything she could to remove that block to get her grandkids to come down to South Florida with them. That's kind of what I expected to be in a lot of similarities with the code words and things that were used against Charlie Adelson. What's the feeling uh, when you were actually at the trial? Well, a hundred percent. I mean, I think uh, the consensus of, among people like yourselves uh, who do uh, defense work was that they were going to basically use a very similar defense about this double extortion uh, by this Latin Kings gang, but add the caveat that Donna was completely in the dark about it. So she just didn't know Charlie was kind of leading her on. Uh, you know, giving her clues, but he didn't want to implicate his own mother. So he never actually told her about the plot. 
And uh, truthfully, I think the uh, circumstantial evidence and some of the direct evidence with these emails is probably, um, you know, more, um, you know, uh, damaging to Donna Adelson than it is to to Charlie. And I think her fate ultimately is going to be the same as uh, Charlie Adelson. I think there will be a conviction. I mean, the thing that really upsets me about all this is that, you know, I've become pretty close with Ruth Markell, who's Dan's mother and Phil Markell, his father and Shelly. And, uh, you know, they're, they're both in the parents are both in their eighties now. And they're, they're telling me openly that they're worried uh, that they're not going to live to see the day, uh, that justice is meted out. So, you know, it, it was supposed to happen. Now it could be as far as a year off, uh, for, from, you know, today. Yeah. They, they seem like an awesome family. I mean, I, I've never spoken to them, I don't know them personally, but they seem like really amazing people. The interviews that I hear from them and how they just keep pushing, keep pressing. They don't let this stop. They don't let this die. It's a real testament to them that the state keeps indicting more uh, co-conspirators. It is a little bit weird, and I don't really fully understand why the state did it like this and took kind of forever. I personally think you could have tried multiple people at the same time, like Donna and Charlie at the very least. Mm -hmm. Um, that's my perspective. I don't know all the evidence. I don't know what they have. I don't know why they waited. And I'm a proponent of making sure you have enough evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt before going forward to try the case. Um, so if they needed to wait, I understand that. I respect that, but it is kind of brutal for the victim's family. Not just that, but they got to go through this trial a million times. It feels right. It's going to be what the fourth trial or fifth trial that they've had to go through. The holidays can create even more waste than usual. Each year, Americans throw away 25% more trash from Thanksgiving to New Year's. What if we told you there was a way to get your holiday shopping done without that guilty feeling? Well, meet Blueland. This holiday season, Blueland is having its best sale of the year, so you can save and shop sustainably for your friends, your family, and even yourself. The idea is simple. Grab one of the forever bottles, fill it with warm water, drop in the tablet, and get cleaning. Refills start as little as $2.25, and you don't have to buy a new plastic bottle every time you run out. You can even set up a subscription or buy in bulk. It has absolutely become a staple in the Tragos household as my wife loves it, I love it, and my kids even love using it. We've had to clean so many different things since the hurricane, and we will continue to have to do that now with all the holidays coming up. So to take advantage of their best sale of the year for up to 30% off your entire order, go to blueland.com slash LYK. You won't want to miss this. Blueland.com slash LYK. One more time, that's blueland.com slash LYK. Yeah. And, and, you know, and then there's a the question of Wendy, like if they go after Wendy, so a lot of people are, are urging the state to go after Donna and Wendy at the same time, but they've been doing it, like you said, methodically, uh, one person at a time, one defendant at a time. Uh, you know, one of the craziest things with Donna Adelson that that's going to really sink her, I think, is she was making plans to leave the country um, and it's all caught on jailhouse call. So in the week Charlie was convicted on November 6 of 2023. So from November 6 of 2023 to uh, the arrest of Donna Adelson on November 13th, which is exactly seven days later. So I think he's convicted on a Monday and she's arrested on a Monday. She's making all these crazy plans to flee the country. She's uh, what's apping uh, Indochina travel, asking them to hurry. How does she get a visa quickly? But then she buys and this is a part I just don't understand. They're financially uh, very well off and they buy, she and her husband get a one-way ticket uh, via Dubai to Vietnam where Charlie had a villa because he liked uh, kind of hanging out in that part of the world. But I mean, just the stupidity. If they had just bought a round trip ticket, which they easily could have afforded, she could have said, look, I was so devastated by my son's yeah. conviction. I just needed time away. But this is just uh, an obvious sign of consciousness of guilt buying this one-way ticket, making a run for it. And she's even caught um, on on some uh, jailhouse calls mentioning Dan, and everyone assumes it's Dan Rashbaum, having helped her to make this decision, which could also be a problem for Dan. Well, yeah, that, that would definitely be a problem. Um, yeah, I, I, that makes no sense to me. Like, how do you not know that's how it's coming? They know the heat's on them. I mean, come on. Everybody knew the heat was on them. Why not just buy the return flight? I don't understand it. It's definitely seemingly going to come in as consciousness of guilt and that's real consciousness of guilt we've seen other cases where they try to make it seem like consciousness of guilt which i don't really buy or vibe with but that is about as much as you can get as far as consciousness of guilt i also think the wendy question right uh, throwing out the the partial immunity deal that she kind of got 
I don't think it makes sense to try her with anybody else. I would have tried, you know, McBanawa fine, but I would have tried Charlie and Donna together. To me, their case is inextricably intertwined. They were involved in setting it up, paying, code words, code language, conversations, you know, even McBanawa being involved in the medical practice. So was Donna Adelson and Harvey and, and Charlie. And if you were going to indict Harvey, sure, throw him in there too. But Wendy was conspicuously left out of so many conversations and group chats and code language and re undercover recordings at restaurants, which was a big reveal before they indicted uh, Charlie Adelson, that I do think Wendy would be a different case. If you had everybody convicted in the conspiracy, I think you have a better chance to tell the story. They all did this for her. She knew she was keeping her hands clean. She threw everybody else under the bus. Let's convict her now. But I do think it is a harder case to win. And if they didn't have the convictions on everybody else, I think it would be a very difficult case to prove against Wendy Adelson with the lack of connection and communication that they have. And they don't have that problem with, with Donna Adelson and Charlie Adelson. Yeah. I mean, these are all great points. I mean, one of the most damning things about uh, Wendy Adelson is that she literally drives completely out of her way from where she was living to the crime scene uh, the morning it happens, uh, which is just a, a super weird coincidence or she knew uh, something was up. But that is like the $64,000 question. Uh, do they go after Wendy? And then uh, the question becomes, do they have enough to go after her? Uh, people are really split on this. You mentioned some of the great attorneys I've talked to. Tim Jansen, um, you know, he's... He has said all along that, you know, he's skeptical that they have enough um, against Wendy. But then you've got um, Carl Steinbeck, who's got his own channel, and, and he is kind of just been dogged about the fact that Wendy needs to be indicted. Even on my show, he came on with 100 plus reasons, which ended up ballooning to 120 reasons uh, why Wendy Adelson should be indicted. And this is my opinion and just my opinion. But. I have no doubt that uh, Wendy knew about this, and I have no doubt that Wendy kind of lit the fire. But uh, Donna Adelson is the matriarch of the family, this dominant, controlling mother, and uh, I think she helped uh, Wendy kind of set the uh, the the fire, and Donna helped it turn into this massive uh, blaze. You know, and it may be one of those questions for the prosecutor: Can I win the case? And if I was in the prosecutor's office and I was looking at this case, just with the evidence I know that we've seen come out in McBanawa's trials and Charlie Adelson's trial, I think they have enough to win a case. But do they have enough to where they feel justice would be served by proving it beyond a reasonable doubt might be a different question, right? I think the story fits, the motive fits. It just makes too much sense, like you say, that Wendy Adelson had some involvement. From what I've seen, though, I just internally feel like I don't know if they have enough to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And so from my perspective, that's what I would need to prosecute a case and go forward on it. Everybody might not see that the same. Um, and it's, it's a really difficult proposition to think that everybody else is going to go down, but the person they were protecting and doing this for is still out there, you know, living her life, um, apparently. And that, that to me is also a tough pill to swallow. And then again, when you talk about the, the Markel family and they've got to look at that and I'm sure, you know, I'd be willing to guess and bet that they think she was involved and knew and had a hand in it. And then to see her still free with their grandkids, right? I mean, that that's another just horribly sad part of all of this is their relationship with um, their grandkids that is is never going to be like it should have been. Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple of interesting uh, things. Um, number one, Ruth Markell and, and Phil Markell hel helped enact legislation called the Dan Markell Act, which basically prevents grandparent alienation, but it doesn't work in this case because you have to be criminally convicted uh, the spouse does. Um, and, and in this case, Wendy has not. But, um, you know, that's been really tough on them is that they've not been able uh, to visit or see their grandchildren, Benjamin and, and Lincoln. Yeah, as much as they want, which is which is awful. But also when they arrested Donna um, at MIA, Miami International, um, they did seize, uh, I think it was two cell phones, at least and a tablet or two. And uh, kind of the rumor mill suggests that there's new evidence on there among the evidence on there was some of these frantic uh messages donna was sending to to um vietnam asking how to expedite the visa but some people think there might be stuff on there related to wendy and that they're just still continuing to build the case so that really remains the mystery and by the way she was living here uh in miami but has since reportedly moved to austin texas 
That got people really nervous because obviously it's a step closer to Mexico, easier to escape. What's she doing? What's she thinking? So these are all questions that people have, but it's such a layered case with so many side stories that it's it's almost hard to believe. Yeah, I, I would be surprised if she if they weren't watching her and she didn't know that they were watching. I'd be shocked if she bought a one way ticket. I'll just put it that way. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, that's an interesting point you made that there could be new information either on cell phones or tablets that they got from Don Adelson, because every time a new person is arrested, you know, whether it's a co-conspirator or whatever, right. An accessory after the fact, whatever it may be, every time they charge a new person, you get access to more, more information, more data, more evidence that's potentially, um, inculpating to that defendant, right? So that, that proves that they are guilty. So you get Don Adelson, you arrest her, and now you have access to so much more. Now, they got a lot of it through Charlie Adelson, obviously, and she was an unindicted co-conspirator. But now that she's actually arrested, now that they're actually proving the case beyond a reasonable doubt, gathering the evidence and the discovery in her case, it absolutely opens up a broader um, power for the state attorney's office to now get records, get documents, get information that they maybe weren't able to get until she was actually charged. And now they have that opportunity. And you're saying the scuttlebutt is there, there might be even more damning information. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're hearing, but, uh, you know, you know, this much better than I, she was given sort of limited immunity in the trials that she testified at. And so I don't know how that, you know, interplays with potential new evidence or things that she has said or has not said, but I can tell you the court of public opinion uh, certainly wants Wendy at the very least indicted and at the very most convicted, but uh, people, you know, people want her uh, to face the consequences for something that they believe widely uh, she is a part of. Yeah. I, I just, I mean, even, even when you said like, it's really damning that she drove by it and drove way out of her way. It's just nowhere near enough from, you know, the way I'm looking at it to prove this yeah. case. And they would have to have more. They'd have to have at least something, especially with this family that thought they could outsmart anybody. It's almost like, and I've had cases, I've had criminal cases where there have been undercover recordings. And one of them, it's almost like, you know, you just bang your head against the wall because I had a client that was like, I know they're listening. I know they're watching. I know they're doing this. And then he would say something incriminating to the undercover FBI agent. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> like yeah. you're right. And it's the guy sitting next to you and the camera's right there in the air vent of the car you guys are talking in. And it was kind of a similar thing in this case where it's like they were speaking in code in case anybody ever read the text messages or in case anybody was recording them. And they were right. They were being recorded and people did read the text messages later, but it was so obviously in code. And yet still, I didn't feel like I heard a ton that directly connected Wendy Adelson or Harvey Adelson for that matter. Yeah. Uh, it just brings up another point. Um, these jailhouse calls that took place between Don and Charlie the week after Charlie's conviction. And he was speaking to his mother between three and five hours a day for a week straight. But if you listen to those calls, there's a very like marked shift uh, in their feelings about Wendy uh, between Donna and Charlie. They're both very unhappy with her. Uh, Charlie, even she wrote a book, which kind of parallels the whole story, which is kind of bizarre in and of itself. And Charlie even mentions that book. So, uh, the other issue at play that people are, you know, thinking about and talking about um, is to either Donna or Charlie, do they turn on on the sister or the daughter? And um, some people think that there are decent chances of that happening because now this reality has set in with Charlie that I'm going to be spending the rest of my life in prison. Not only that, he's allegedly been green lighted. He had to be moved to South Dakota. So, I mean, he's literally got a target on his back and maybe he'll do whatever he can to, to you know, try to mitigate the damage by flipping on her. So, you know, time's going to tell. It's definitely seemed, I will say. Uh, the, the shocking part to me about the whole Offerman motion and everything that happened there was not that there was an issue with the conflict wa waivers, right? That, I mean, that, that was shocking. But the most shocking thing to me was, hold on a second. I feel like the Adelson four, Harvey, Donna, Charlie, Wendy, have been a united front, protecting each other, not pointing the finger at each other, not giving up or saying any more than they absolutely had to with the evidence that was presented to them. Like, here's a text message where you said this. They don't explain anything more or less than what's in that text message, but they try to explain it in a way that does not implicate any of the four Adelsons. That felt like it changed with Ufferman's motion because he is, there's no doubt about it, he is hurting his mom's defense. I believe Daniel Rashbaum would have been more prepared for a trial 
than most lawyers will be in a couple months. Now, maybe if they give them a year or a year and a half, sure, maybe they'll have time to catch up. But at this point, nobody's as prepared or understands the dynamics or has the rapport with Don Adelson because you saw her sobbing in the courtroom, right, when Dan Rashbaum withdrew from the case. Mm -hmm. Charlie Adelson hurt Donna Adelson's case that day. He did it to help his case. It's the first selfish act between the four, not selfish act of their life, but between right. the four that made me think maybe there's not such a united front. Maybe things are changing. And is that going to be Charlie Adelson pointing the finger at Harvey or pointing the finger at Wendy? For the first time, the answer might be maybe because before that, to me, the answer was a flat out no. 100% agree with you. I mean, uh, you put it great with the, uh, the phrase the united front. I mean, they had each other's backs, but now, again, this reality is really setting in, and it's setting in for Donna, too, who's been behind bars for a year and potentially another year awaiting trial. There's all these issues, too, obviously, with the speedy trial, or constitutional right to a speedy trial. Uh, now that's been delayed, but, uh, you know, obviously the at the forefront of all this is Dan Markell and his kids, and obviously the parents we just talked about, you know, Ruth and Phil and the sister who are sitting here uh, waiting uh, for justice to arrive. And it's just, you know, it's painful uh, just from my vantage point. I can't imagine from theirs to watch them wait for this and, and have it unfold. So it's um, such a tangled, you know, uh, Alec Murdoch said, what a tangled web we weave. And uh, definitely true in this case as well. Yeah, it's really sad because on one hand, I can't blame Don Adelson for this delay because I mean, you got new lawyers on the case. You can't force them to go to trial in a month. But at the same time, it's like, this all seems like it was avoidable, um, all of the lawyer issues. And then we get on the eve of trial and that's when it all explodes, which is, you know, really unfortunate. But from my perspective, all the different people involved, all the different sideshows and side stories of this case, I do have to give credit to law enforcement and the state for going through, getting these convictions, trying people twice if they have to, proving difficult cases at times with a lot of circumstantial evidence and one by one lining them up, knocking them down. And they're continuing. There's no doubt in my mind, they're going to go after everybody they think they can prove a case against, you know, reasonably speaking, ethically speaking, if they believe they can prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt that you committed a crime in this conspiracy, they are going to go forward against you. So at least the Markells, I think, can take some solace in that, that they have people that are hearing them, that are fighting for them, fighting for the victims, fighting for justice for Dan Markell. Um, and I think it's just really cool that we get to see what that looks like, even if it's difficult and a lot more drawn out than it is in certain scenarios. Yeah. Uh, one, one last thing that I want to mention, uh, that was interesting talking about the possibility of somebody flipping on somebody else is when, when this all boiled over and kind of came to a screeching halt with Dan Rashbaum removed, then Alex Morris at that point was still, um, he, he was still Donna's attorney and in kind of an impromptu press conference outside that was yes. later followed up by Jack Campbell, who's uh, the state attorney, um, they both made mention of potential pleas, uh, trying to work out a deal. So that was another reason people thought, oh, Don is going to definitely out Wendy or something's going to happen. It's been pretty silent since then. But again, um, you know, you know this better than anybody. Uh, that silence can break at any moment and things can change uh, on the drop of a hat. No matter how confident you are, every time somebody in your conspiracy gets convicted, you get a little less confident, number one. Number two, I thought you were going to mention where Alex Morris said something to the effect of, maybe there are arguments on the table now that Dan Rashbaum is gone that weren't on the table before. And that I thought was a damning comment for, for Dan Rashbaum. You know, whether it was, you know, he wasn't allowing Wendy to point the finger at Charlie or vice versa, or cooperate, like you said, for some kind of plea deal. And maybe that would be on the table. Now Alex Morris is gone, so we don't know if that's going to be opening up, but Things are different, right? Things are different than when they were all sitting in their, you know, multi-million dollar homes and condos. Everything is very different now. I don't think there's a doubt about that. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. We're doing a show tonight just about why are these husbands, doesn't exactly fit this case, but why why are people ending marriages with uh, the killing of a spouse? So that's a whole other topic, a whole other story, but people just do not think about the consequences, the ripple effect of... Uh, that all the victims have to deal with. So it's just, it's horrendous. And this is a horrible, but a fascinating story. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, you couldn't even write the movie because people wouldn't believe it. That's what I've said about this case multiple times. Well, Joel, thanks for coming on. We're going to put all of uh, your links in the description if anyone wants to check him out, especially on this case, because he's going to be boots on the ground. He was also at uh, Sarah Boone's trial and was tweet live tweeting it and reporting on that as well. And And like I said, there are, a lot of people that do a lot of great work that are inside courtrooms, I, I don't know 
a lot of people personally or talk to a lot of people. So, you know, I kind of pick and choose who I'm going to retweet or who I'm going to comment on and who I can talk to to kind of see the details coming out. But Joel is somebody I like when he's there and he's tweeting about it and commenting on it because I know I can take that and work with it and try to learn from it and explain things from it in the way that he phrases it and reports it out. Um, so I always appreciate that, uh, Joel, as somebody who follows you as well. And I'm sure a lot of people do too. If you guys have comments or questions about the case, throw them in the comment section, hit the like button, give us the reviews on podcast networks, do all the things. Joel, thank you so much for being with me, man. Thank you, man. Very quickly, I just want to say, listen, in this world, it's very competitive as it was in my pre previous world in media. But, um, you know, I think a lot of, there's a misconception out there. I look at Peter, what he's doing, uh, what, what you've done with your channel is absolutely incredible. It's growing like wildfire. So uh, we watch you. We take clues from you. And uh, as Steve Cohen says, a rising tide lifts all ships. But you have inspired us to be better and uh, really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. That's all we got. Till next time, we're out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.